feeling different reactions from different stakeholders on the issue of free senior high school in Ghana. The question is, what are your initial reactions to this? Prof. Okay, it can be in any order. Anyone can react to it first. But, uh, as we say, very topical issue, and that uh, there are ways of looking at it. I, the youth are those who the future is for. A better future depends on properly well-trained, skilled youth. So the, the theme is quite apt. And therefore, how do we position our youth to be properly trained to take over when we are gone? The government of Ghana, like you said, 2017, found it quite imperative to introduce the free SHS. It was a deliberate policy, purpose, to make sure that we improve the literacy level of the youth, to increase access to post primary education among the youth or the citizenry. Again, let us look more into advantages, why this policy has to come in place. We all do acknowledge that an illiterate population will not be able to augur well for development. It's something we all do agree. How do we translate this? By helping the teeming majority of our youth who otherwise, after post-primary, will not be able to transition to senior high school affordability. And so a program like this, one seeks to increase the literacy of the population, especially among the youth, accessibility. And again, if I may add, other advantages. For example, a free senior high will let the girl child have a postponed first birth. So population growth will be checked because they will want to be properly educated before they start giving birth. So apart from being skilled, highly skilled labor, which will move away from the mundane uh, agri sector where they may go without any skills, this allows them to be properly train for high skill labor and also other issues I've just enumerated, if I can just end here. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, to add to what Prof said, uh, it, it's been a very bold decision. It hasn't been an easy decision to go for that particular policy. But when you look at it in terms of what we were getting, the statistics show that for the past four years until the implementation of the program, from 2013 to 2016, an average of 27.3% of students who graduated from the BEC who were actually enrolled, in fact, they had been given admission through the computerized school selection placement system, did not enroll because they could not afford to pay. 23% on average for four years. So we are getting this number, percentage of young people whose education have been curtailed after JHS. And 
looking at the nation that we want to build, I think it will be a disaster if we deny these people additional advancement in their educational system. So this is what I want to add on to. So it's a bold decision. It's a, it has its own teaching, but any new innovation issues that we start, you always get some challenges coming up. But we'll sort them out. I believe, um, as the panel members said, um, the free S the free HS SHS is a bold initiative, and as was eloquently stated by Professor Etienne, um, every country would aspire to what policy they think could be used to address the issue of access to education, particularly when we are looking at uh, building human capital. And as we know, human capital is the driving force of every economic uh, drive uh, force in a, in a nation. And for the country to move forward, we need to look at how we are going to prepare the next generation of professionals, which is going through the educational system. And I think, as we said, there seems to be a halt when they come out of the JHS. Parents are stuck with funding. How do I pay for my child to move on to free onto the educational track? Some of us were fortunate to get a free education all the way to uh, university, but these days that's not the case. And then if you look at the what the population looks like, we ha we having that bulge where we have a huge a teeming population of youth that we need to prepare for our future if that's we're going to move forward as a country. And I think the government took that bold step of trying, of doing what it has to do. Uh, the challenges were enormous, uh, and I think uh, it was thought of something that couldn't be done. But I think it was a bold policy that has been taken, was taken up by the government to make that move. And I think with all what the situations are, I think first, it meets the SD, SDG 4 uh, goal. It's an attempt at meeting that goal. Uh, it also creates opportunity for affordance where parents don't have to think about how they were going to pay for their, their uh, children to go through school. So I think in every, in every facet of what a policy is, I think it's a good step. But now we are seeing it also it presented as an opportunity and it's also presented as some challenges, and that is what is being addressed. You, you talk about the double track, it's also the challenges that how do we address the enrollment potential that is coming, and I think for tertiary education, we should also be prepared for the tsunami of, of, of uh, we talk about unemployed graduates, we should think about unemployed SHS 2020, and that is the critical point that are for tertiary institutions, we have to think about how are we going to prepare for this tsunami of graduates that are going to come out of SHS. And that's the concern for me. So Dr. Labi, before I think you continue from where you left, it takes yeah. us to our second question. Do you think the three senior high schools guaranteed access to higher education for Ghanaian students? Okay, thank you very much for the question. But before I go on to talk about that, let me quickly just say something based on research. And the fact that I do believe that the senior, the free senior high school system is, is good. And that uh, you don't have any initiatives without uh, issues, without challenges. So we have to embrace the challenges and move on. But this is, this is uh, a study that was conducted by Harvard, MIT, and Stanford University in Ghana here. The research was conducted from um, 2008, and it's still ongoing. It involved five regions in Ghana. They selected 177 um, districts, and then um, sampled 54 districts out of that. And uh, the sample uh, was a student who had come out of the JHS, GH, but were waiting for the one year before they enter the senior secondary school. Um, I, I'm, I'm used to senior secondary school <laughs> and senior high school, so please forgive me. So they, um, 
interview the students why you know they were not in school and they were hoping that they were going to respond to the fact that um, you know it takes Ghana I think um, people come out of junior secondary school they have to wait for one year or something like that but 95 percent of the sampling population said they were not in school because of finances 95 percent and they were not in school two percent uh, was made up of girls they were pregnant and the three percent had various reasons why they were not in school so when I read that and uh, I you know kind of had people talking about the fact that we were not ready and all that I was like when are we going to be ready again one other thing that I'm looking at is for the fact that we need uh, Ghanaians to be educated I think the CD or something was changed in 2007 or something there from the thousands to um, 2000 or whatever it is. I wasn't here, so please pardon me for that. But you see, since 2007 to date, people are still using thousands. And I look at kids going to school and uh, like five years, 10 years, they go to buy you know, from the shops, they have 20 pesos. And then they, they will be like, I want to buy biscuits. And he says 2,000 CDs. 2,000 CDs biscuits? 2 million CDs for whatever? I'm like, what kind of education are we receiving? So again, even though we have challenges associated with the implementation of the policy, I believe that, you know, the better we educate the youth, uh, the more we educate the youth, the better. Now looking at the access, how do we get all these students with the double track system to go into tertiary education? And just like uh, the other panelists have indicated, they're coming out as graduates from the SHS, and where would they go to? Because we still have our university system. No expansion. We're crying for physical infrastructure. But can we think of other alternatives to make sure that the students will qualify? Because again, based on the research that I, I, I talked about, out of the 100% sampling, 40% of the students were those of the academic track. That is the sciences and general arts. And those in the vocational tract, according to their research, which is of course ongoing, they decided not to go to the university, but to go to the technical and vocational universities. So it is the student who is deciding what to do after high school. We are not thinking for them into believing that all the universities should be expanded to absorb all the students that are coming out because 40% out of the research decided to go to university. All the others decided they were going to go to follow the, the um, vocational and technical tract. But there are other ways we can expand the university system to absorb those who are interested in going to the university. We've always been looking at the traditional system. What about the non-traditional system? with advances in technology. I think I'll talk about that maybe with the next question. But with advances in technology, are we as Africans thinking of other ways that we can help students to achieve not only in the brick and mortar, you know, classrooms, but using technology and the internet to assess education as is being done globally. Thank you. Thank you. Can we... Let me use this privilege of uh, introducing Professor Harrison Dapa and also seek your initial comments on what you think the free SHS offers for access to higher education. In short, with the free SHS, what is it going to be like for access to higher education in Ghana? Thank you very much. Once I first apologize for the lateness, 
And I want to correct that I'm Olivia Kwapon. <laughs> yeah. You are Harris. Yeah. And if I want to contribute to the voice on the floor, I would say that, I mean, every average Ghanaian would agree that this is one of the best things that have happened to us as a country. And I would say that it's only a selfish person who would say that this is not good. That means that, you know, you, you don't want your neighbor to benefit from the quality or the beauty of education. Because education, I'm an adult educator, and my belief is that everybody must be educated. And my illiterate mother, if she's educated, she will do her farming differently. And the watcher seller who is educated will give us different watches of better quality with good health. And therefore, education is not a privilege, but a right. And everybody must have it. And interestingly, the developing countries that we connect ourselves and compare to, the easiest opportunity for them to get is education. No matter your level, no matter your age, if you say you want to start from cradle to the grave, you would have the opportunity. And that's the difference between them and us. And if we see education as a tool for development that way, and a human resource development tool, then why should we deprive some and give access to some? And therefore, I'm all for this wonderful thing that has happened to the country. On the issue of the freeness thing, I would, yes, it is good. Some people cannot afford. But I also want us to see a system that will also harness some resources for those who can afford. So that it will not just be a free lunch for everybody, but there should be a system that those who can afford, even if it is one city, that you can afford because there's value addition when you are contributing to something. And you, you look at it different, differently and manage it differently. So if you have opportunity to put a dime and contribute to it, I think we would appreciate it differently. And then, you know, the student will see the value more and the parents also see the value more. So there should be a system for someone because the Ghanaian can afford something. The way we do our funerals and our other lifestyles, I think with all of that, we can contribute to education. And one thing I ask myself, I was just discussing over this weekend that, you know, say, oh, everything now is doing well, even the food, the, the tr articulator trust come with food and all of that, everything to be provided. I said, wow, I'm looking for the chief of a community who will say that, look at what this president is doing to take care of our kids. If it is one bunch of plantain, bring it. If it is one piece of yam, bring it. If it is a basket of pepper, bring it. Let us have a vast load of food items and let us go and give it to the school in our community and say that we're the traditional leader of this community. This is our, contributing, our contribution to feeding the kids that the government has provided the system for. Access to higher education should not be... <laughs> and then, I mean, all the various organizations, Nestle will say, I'm giving you, you know, milk. I mean, we should all contribute to the basket, and I, I thought there's so much you could do. But access to higher ed, there is a way. Mr. Mponsa is here. He knows what he's doing for University of Ghana to widen access through the distance education program. And even this multi-track has said that we should fill in the gap with distance education activity. So the kids who are in the house now, I expect that teachers give them homework, vacation homework. Whereby, as they are in the house, they could go online. Those who can, they could be offline activities, study materials, hard and soft copies, so that once they are in the house for six weeks, whatever, they have series of units to cover with activities attached. Some can be sent, submitted online, so that by the time they go back to school, they have interacted and have been engaging in activities. But we could also do more with other practical activities. And therefore, for me, for education, if everybody is holding a PhD degree, it is better for the country. And therefore, there should be no limitation whatsoever. And then, now people are appointing people for work not because of certificate. They look at the attitude because that is what speaks volumes. So it's not about the paper. Let them pass through the system. It is an environment for grooming. Let them groom them. And when we groom them, when that person is educated to the highest level and is a messenger, you the head of that organization, you have less stress. Professor Harrison, you have a take on the same question, the issue of access to higher education. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 
whilst at the secondary level, we, we know that there is improved access now because the data actually shows. Uh, in 2017, we have close to about 300 and 358,205 for the first batch of the free SHS. And currently for 2018, as of September 2018, 472,730. So definitely, at that particular level, access uh, has improved. But in tertiary, it's going to be a challenge. Because currently, when you look at the enrollment in our tertiary institutions, we have 10 public universities. Currently, the estimated enrollment is about 147,180. 108 private university colleges. The enrollment is about 64,112. Eight technical universities plus two polytechnics. 53,978. 40 colleges of education, which are all tertiary. 36,563. We have 27 nursing training colleges in an area of 20,500. Then there are public special institutions like GIJ, G uh, G NAFTI, who, which are also in the tertiary realm. So we are looking at an estimated of about 350,000 for this. Currently, the students who are enrolled. So let's take that. That is the space that we have for our tertiary institutions in the country. So when you look at the, even just the two batches of free SHS students, close to 800,000. So when we have a third one, which definitely, they are going to be more than the second batch. Then we have a problem of having access in the tertiary education to cater for them. So therefore, as indicated by other panelists, we have to look at the different modes of delivery. Innovation has to come in. How are we going to, are we going to, do we want all these students to be in the wall as we have now? And how are we going to get, them? so we need to look at the different modes of delivery to be able to ensure that these students which are coming through this free SHS will have access to education. A tertiary education. Prof wants to add. Yeah, <coughs> thank you. If I may add a little bit to what has just been said, I think we can see trouble ahead, but that does not mean that we shouldn't uh, rise up to the challenge. Uh, when Prof talks about the existing traditional uh, places of the getting accessibility. I think that the honors of, you see, the idea of the technical university that came to the fore, I think is also one way by which we will try to shift our emphasis to the kind of education that we have put a lot of emphasis on for all this while. The proper hands-on training. Sometimes I wonder, how will it be like for me to take my car, which is electronic, to the garage, the fitter, and the guy who looks at it is actually someone who has been to Kenya University or some other or some technical school training, and not those guys who are just doing trauma care. You know, so 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 these are some of the challenges that we really have to look at. We have to make sure that some of these technical universities that are coming to the fore really don't go back to do some of the things that we found like Kenya University being set up primarily for science and technology, but ending up doing almost about 60% of business and other humanity courses. So with these technical universities, I think that the policy must be much more strictly put to them that, look, you are here to train, give hands-on training to our artisans, to our uh, all the level, not just necessarily a degree. I will also want to emphasize Technical training that gives you certificates, diploma, 
The important thing is that you should have the skill training to be able to make a living. And I tell you, those guys at the garages, they are making so much money than any of us here. You take your car there, the guy who come and check with the electronic thing, he finishes, he says, 600 Ghana cities. <laughs> Does any of the professors here get 600 Ghana cities per an hour? No. I, don't, I doubt. So these are some of the things that I think that we should. There are avenues if we look. And then the gap. I read somewhere about someone who has a program as to the double track when they are at home. You need to give them a kind of uh, online. I, 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 I've read somewhere. I'll, I'll look for it. But there's a way by which we just don't use the brick and mortar system of education, but distance and electronic and online to be able to make way for more people to have access and have quality. And I will say that that onerous belief by some who are peddling that high accessibility also means low quality does really not really exist. We should debunk that thumb. There are research by, you know, Kenya went to Kenya 2003 had um, free primary education. Then 2007 went to have um, to a level of having free SHS, our free SHS. And people have done research to find that it does not lower the quality whatsoever. All that we need to do is to work harder to make sure that everybody who gets that access is properly educated. We're talking about quality. What about if you never entered at all? That quality and entering, let's say it's half, which one is better? Thank you. Um, in terms of access, I think, um, as uh, most of the other panels talked about, I think leveraging um, other methods of uh, access or providing education, um, as been eloquently stated, is very important. That is, uh, in, yeah, among the traditional, we should also adopt other open uh, distance education as part of it. The double track, the students don't have to be home. When they are home, the class was said. They should be still studying. You know, they don't have to be on break until they go back. That time, they could access content online in an open environment and studying as they are home because it's just like the semester system. So instead of being there, they can also be steady and be preparing for the next time when they are back to school. And I think one of the issue as um, with access is resources. Uh, if you, uh, the, all the enumerated uh, technology in, or, or, or the institutions that are available, there are resources within. And I think the, the investors or tertiary institutions should look at ways in which we can leverage resources, not just subject matter aspect, but in terms of facility, uh, technology, infrastructure, um, that could be leveraged among. I mean, I look at uh, University of Ghana, has a lot of affiliate institutions um, that are getting the same in university degree, but we have a, a learning management system that can robustly host all these other institutions to bring their online uh, components on board and leverage that resource that is there. So we can leverage resources as sharing. We live in a knowledge economy, it's a shared economy. So we have to look at ways in which we can share some of these resources as opposed to this university just acquiring their own and others acquiring their own. Um, and as was eloquently st also stated, the VOTEC, when you talk about the universities, uh, the technical institutions being moved into universities offering the same, um, I think, the same degree or paper. At the US, they have community colleges that fill the middle gap. And that is where things are important. That the community college where you have technical, hands-on, uh, technical uh, expertise, that when you come out, you fill in the gap and not just looking at just an investor. So when you look at all these type of uh, levels or the, in the continuum in terms of the value chain, we can appropriately leverage resources within and meet the, the needs of access. And so when the students graduate and they come from SHS, at least we'll be ready to show that our responsibility of, of uh, the population of graduates that are coming into our institutions. Okay. Dr. Labi. Yeah. Um, thank you. I would like to um, 
look at the population issue. Um, again, looking at ASUS, we have so many avenues to get the students into the tertiary institutions. And when I talk about the tertiary institutions, I'm not limiting myself to only, you know, the universities. There are other institutions the students can go. But again, let me give you just few <laughs> examples of what is happening elsewhere. We're looking at 800,000. Did you say 800,000? Because I was looking at the figures and uh, I couldn't get the figures. But using the open and distance learning enrollment system, a university like Idra Gandhi University, open university in India, has 4 million students through the open and distance learning. 4 million students. We hear 800,000 and we are crying. You know, South Africa, uh, University of South Africa, where many Ghanaians are taking courses, as at now, for their PhDs, do have 400,000 students through the open and distance learning. They graduate 40,000 students almost every year. We have 800,000 students, we are crying. You know, because we think the world is coming to an end and it's a huge thing. And instead of maybe looking at other ways of delivery, we're looking at expanding infra physical infrastructure. No, that wouldn't help. I, I, I times sit and look at, you know, listen to the debate that is going on and I'm like, if uh, people are calling for the expansion of physical infrastructure, have we thought of the amount as compared to, say, the cost-benefit analysis of expanding our ICT infrastructure as to expanding our university system? Because already we have about 80,000 private, um, 80 private universities and 10, you know, public universities. And so how many more do we need in Ghana? How many more universities do we need to expand to what level for us to, you know, absorb these students? We have to be innovative. The um, British Open University has 174,000 students, and some of the students are Ghanaians. You know, Ghanaians taking courses from there. They started 1969 with 24,000 students, initial students, 24,000. And we are here still crying about expanding physical infrastructure. Even our distance education programs in Ghana, offered by the public universities, are expanding through physical infrastructure. They have satellite campuses. And what is the difference between that and, you know, uh, interacting with students on the main campus? Because I don't know, but I do believe that they go there to meet with the student face to face. So what is the distance about it? What is the distance about that? I see a lot of people sending you know, messages through WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is internet based. WhatsApp is internet based. And people sit on, on, on uh, WhatsApp throughout the night sending just messages. Why can't you use that as a platform for learning? Again, like he mentioned, the high school system, elsewhere they have virtual high school system. So if students are going to sit at home for say 100 days or how many days, can't we have a virtual platform where students can go, even if it's a district base, where they can go to assess learning materials as a supplementary you know, kind of materials or you know, for remedials, assuming that they are not doing well in specific uh, subjects. These are some of the things we can think about because after all, online learning started as a generational model from the distance learning system. And distance learning started in the 17th century. And Ghana, we are still practicing those systems that started in the 18th and the 19th century. And I'm sure other African countries are doing the same. Why can't we think about expanding our ICT infrastructure such that students, even if we cannot get to the rural areas, we can have kind of steady centers. I know gone were the days when they had those uh, uh, resource centers where they could take students 
there to learn and all that, use the computer, learning how to use the mouse or something like that. And that was in the 1990s or something, you know, around that area. From that time to date, are they still studying how to use the mouse, which happens to be the standard, the performance standard for kindergarten, you know, students elsewhere. So please, uh, there are so many avenues that we can use to get these students engaged. And like they are saying, we don't have to always be in the physical classroom. We have to be innovative. Our programs, uh, the, the morning panel discussed that. Um, I, um, the, the, the vice president, I believe, of Lawe Open University was trying to you know, talk about the Open University system. And that is the, the, the one that has been you know, the first one, or the second one in West Africa, and the first in Ghana. Yes, we need to use that. But again, we need standardization. You know, we need to standardize how it is done. You cannot just go in and then um, say that, okay, I want to run a program in engineering or a program in education and ask students to select anything to do. But we have what is called adaptive learning. And that can be used for the comp uh, competency-based education system. You know, in that case, you don't have to follow the tract as the structured program in the university. Say, if you want to take um, engineering and you have to complete about 120 credit hours, and after, the, after graduation, you realize that some of the courses you took <laughs> do not have anything to do with you know, your future career or what you are looking at. Why can't we just have a program? an adapt adaptive kind of learning where students can select courses they believe can help them with their future career and go ahead with that. It's done elsewhere. Why can't we start thinking about things like that? By forcing students to do you know, programs that are not going to help them. So the ability to structure our programs in the university, they talked about diversification and harmonization of programs early in the morning. We can adopt some of these strategies and see how we can move forward to you know, create access for the students who we are going to turn out as we pursue the free senior SHS. Thank you. Okay. So, well, that's that. I think uh, you, the team has uh, done very well with the first three topics. But what we have heard over time in the Ghanaian media is the issue of uh, bad feeding, the issue of uh, uh, students studying under trees sometimes, the issue of uh, overcrowded students in one dormitory. What do you make of the quality of the free senior high school system? I think I'll take it and then pass it on to, you know. Um, just like uh, Professor Copon said, I, I don't think it's the responsibility of the government to shoulder all the um, costs of the free senior SHS. Number two, I do believe that the boarding system, I mean, we should try and move towards creating community secondary schools or community senior high schools, instead of encouraging that people should go to the boarding houses for us to, or for the government, if I say for us, because I'm also a taxpayer, of course, so uh, my money is being used. But to pay for um, the boarding system, we can create um, quality, you know, community senior high schools, such that people living in that community can attend those schools. Schools can be upgraded. And if we are talking about upgrading the schools and looking at the students, we also have to look at the resources that we are going to use, you know, in addressing the quality of the programs. And then look at the teachers as well in the senior uh, high school system. We are talking about the fact that we can use technology and all that. What type of education are we giving to the teacher education system for them to catch up? with the technology that the students are used to, because most of them um, are kind of uh, uh, digital immigrants, where the students are digital in, uh, natives, meaning that uh, people will be like, who were born before 
<laughs> yeah, born before computers and therefore it's very difficult for them to catch up. But it's easy. Um, one thing that I keep telling, you know, um, those who want to use technology in education is that forget about the fact that it's ICT. If you can read and write, and it tells you click on this and you can click on that, you don't have any problem. But again, we have to improve on the professional development of the teachers who are going to handle the students, which is very, very important. If students are ready to learn and external factors, including quality instruction, is not available for the students to use, then it becomes a problem. So there are so many things we can look at, one being teacher education, you know, then the resources. But I bet you there are so many resources available there that we can use to supplement what we are doing in the classroom, so many of them. People are there just developing, you know, materials to supplement what is being taught in class. But if we are not using technology, then of course we are not going to have access to those materials. There are m thousands out there, some of which are for free, that people are developing for us to use in supplementing what we are doing in class up to even the university level. So yes, quality. But for me, I will say that we have to be innovative by moving away from the brick and mortar system and look at other alternatives which can equally serve our students when it comes to quality of our education. Thank you. Yes, Prof. Same question. <laughs> uh, I, I think when you look at, we talk about quality in education, uh, first and foremost, you, you, the first person or the first uh, factor, try factor in the equation is the subject matter aspect. And as she eloquently said, what is the preparation of our teachers uh, in terms of, and uh, when you talk about um, taking on so many students at one point in time, was the thought put into what are the numbers of uh, teachers that are going to be ready to shoulder this responsibility of free access? I'm not sure if that was critically talked about in terms of looking at, do we have enough teachers for all these students that are going to come through free HS? And if they are, what is the quality of that subject matter aspect? Because that is key. If that person is not prepared and ready, then whatever free you allow, the open door, the floodgates, they will come and they will, they will still come out empty. So I think that is a, a very key Im ingredient that needs to be looked at, the teachers or the subject matter aspect. Then as Prof said, the resources. Yes, it's a government policy. But then who are going to that, who are going to the school? The community as a whole. As Professor Quapon said, what is the responsibility of the community in shouldering that responsibility? aside from the government giving free education. There's a whole lot of talk about our communities and our district. What are they doing in terms of providing these resources about feeding? If the government has provided free education, which removes you the responsibility of paying for the fees, couldn't you have contributed to the feeding? I'm not saying it's uh, what you call a philanthropy, uh, sort of thing, but I think the community also, it takes a community or they say it takes a community to raise people. The same thing that has to do with the education. What is the community responsibility? It's not the government's alone to share, and government is us. So that also to be, uh, needs to be looked at. Prof, I will, no, I, I will think that uh, earlier when uh, Professor Olivia made is the same i had this question in mind now the reasoning is that when a government comes out with a policy it is based on a number of factors including the ability to implement now i would want to reason and i'm sure many others would want to reason the same that before government came out with that policy the reasoning was that there's a lot of financial burden on parents okay so ba basically on the uh, the issue of poverty so if government considers this and then implement a policy trying to alleviate or take off some financial burdens or economic burdens from parents, don't you think that will be defeating that same policy 
if there are expectations of the communities to provide things like food, bringing food to the school and all of that. Why then wouldn't you just say, let them pay for it so that you know that everybody is paying rather than implementing a policy, then later there are some expectations that communities would contribute. Now remember, these communities are already contributing in the form of taxes. That's, that's my reason. I don't know what, I don't know. Yes, Prof. Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, as you said that, I didn't do a government. But I was thinking, who is the government? Who is the government? Government for the people, of the people, by the people. You see, I think that policymakers sometimes also make a mistake not to try to embrace our support by letting it look far distant that we will do everything. That is something that we need to tell the people. Like, there are some of us here who really can, on our own, afford, like he said, be able to send our children to school and pay, not everybody. So the community somehow should be engaged in certain, not the full extent, but certain subtle, small, small ways by which we can support. I think it's not wrong to say that if you are in the community, if someone comes to help, are there ways by the community can say, oh, a teacher, stay here for free. Can we give you certain support? We are doing all this some time back. Who says we don't have money? We go to funerals every now and then, we spend money in other areas. Where our priorities lie, so should be our focus. So I think that maybe the way we communicate, let it look like we can do everything. That is where the problem might be. Um, when we talk about the costs, I want to say something. That we all agree that we can use other ways than the traditional methods to be able to have increased accessibility. We all do agree here. The question is, distance education does not be, it's not a new thing. It has been around for quite some time. And some others. I think there's something that we all need to take into consideration. Attitudinal behavior. Uh, we, do, we do admit, Prof is here. Sometimes we admit somebody and you want to put him on, say, distance. Say, distance, there, no. It's because we are making it look like it's an inferior type of education. Can we educate the people that these are alternative sources that are equally good, sometimes even better? You can do other things whilst you still have your education. Thank you. Thank you. On the issue of challenges, good things come with challenges especially groundbreaking issues like this. And there are always solutions to them. So the challenges should not um, prevent us from perceiving such a good thing. I mean, as our sister was talking about, you know, giving us some international perspectives, we also know that the advanced communities, but even their secondary schools is predominant. And they do more of that. Could we look at that? I'm not saying that because I went to a day secondary school, but I did. And then they said, and I did it, and it served me well. At least it's better than not getting. So I feel that whatever situation may be, there will be challenges. But there are ways around it. And the challenges should not deprive us of the great opportunities that it comes with. There are solutions, and let's explore that. And the community contribution, as Prof. Adabo said, I mean, we can't run away from it. Government has taken the role, so you just fold your arms. No there can always be contributions from the community. The widows might can go a long way to support the processes and therefore this good intervention. On tech, vocational technical education, I'm all for it. And I'm expecting a lot from Corvette. I'm expecting a lot from Corvette. The grammar, grammar, grammar is what has contributed to this big time unemployment issues we faced with. And therefore for us, our whole life is technical vocational. From our, everything about us is technical vocational. And that is where the opportunities are. That is where the jobs are. And therefore, we must uh, emphasize that aspect of education. Thank you. Prof, before you hand over the mic, mm -hmm. do you think uh, the free SHS is sustainable? 
It is. It is sustainable. I mean, uh, Prof, you, 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 you gave a quite, uh, you know, a, a big statement. I said, where your focus is, you, say, you said something, where your, you know, where your priority is, that's where you focus. So it is sustainable. And education is the number one that we all need. So as a country, if we put all our resources together to contribute to that. But I've still also made a statement that there are some Ghanaians who can contribute. Let us give them the opportunity to contribute. If we all put hands on deck and support the government, we can take it very far. Prof, the same question. Same question. Myself. No, no, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'll, I'll agree with Prof that for us to be able to sustain it, we have to look into the future of reducing this uh, type of SHS that we have. We should be more community-based. And that was how, why the previous government, for example, when they said they were building the community secondary schools, some of us were, even though the places that they put the buildings some of the places, let me put it that way, did not actually kind of encourage the communities coming from home to that place. Other than that, if that had been done, and now going forward with this particular policy, we follow up with them and make him, because in the advanced countries, how many boarding SHS do you have? Senior high schools? No, 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 no. Most are community-based, and the people go from their home to the school. So if we do that, we will be sustainable. Just to give you, before even the double track was proposed, when you look at the statistics, government said it required 1.3 billion in monodex furniture. If we had community